Uh, my name is John Bodner. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, we this afternoon we are we have a Brannigan lecture. This is the seventh Brannigan lecture that the Institute has sponsored this year uh, for a complete list of uh, past and uh, future Brannigan lectures this uh, academic year. Check out the website. I use Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, the next one will be April, a week from Wednesday, actually, at 3 in the afternoon. Thomas Edsel of Columbia University will be speaking on media and the politics. Um, our speaker today, uh, who will be introduced by Professor Bukur, uh, comes to us in part because um, she was uh, sponsored by a new knowledge seminar that the Institute for Advanced Study is uh, sponsoring and running this year, uh, Gender and Citizenship in the Post-Cold War World. And uh, I mention that because uh, the Institute is sponsoring several of these new knowledge seminars this year and holds competitions every year. And if you're interested in uh, applying for next year, and the deadline is rapidly approaching for new knowledge seminars, again, I invite you to visit our website. So I'll turn the program over to Professor Maria Bukur of History to introduce uh, Professor Merchant today. Well, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Carolyn Merchant, who hails to us from Berkeley University. Uh, Carolyn Merchant is Chancellor's Professor of Environmental History, Philosophy and Ethics in the Department of Environmental Studies, uh, Science, Policy, and Management at the University of California, Berkeley. She is the author of many books, including The Death of Nature, Women, Ecology, and the Scientific Revolution, published in 1980. Ecological Revolutions, Nature, Gender, and Science in New England, published in 1989. Uh, more recently, uh, The Columbia Guide to American Environmental History and Reinventing Eden, The Fate of Nature in Western Culture, published in 2003, and then again in 2004. She's also published numerous articles on the history of science, environmental history, and women in the environment. And she is the editor of Major Problems in American Environmental History, uh, with an edition most recently in 2005. <clears throat> She's also uh, co-edited together with John McNeil and Shepard Creech III, um, the Encyclopedia of World Environmental History, which came out in 2003. So you can see here a very, very rich uh, scholarly production. A professor merchant graduated uh, from Vassar College and received her master's and doctoral degrees from the University of Wisconsin and Madison in the history of science, and also an honorary degree, a doctorate from UMEA, is that correct? UMEA, University in Sweden. She has been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study, Behavioral Studies at Stanford, uh, the John Dean Cantor T. MacArthur Fellow in the Ecological Humanities at the National Humanities Center, a fellow of the American Council of Learned Societies, a Guggenheim Fellow, a Fulbright Scholar in Sweden, and the 1991 Eco-Feminist Scholar at Murdoch University in Western Australia. She is a past president of the American Society for Environmental History and has served on the executive and advisory boards of the History of Science Society, Environmental History, Environmental Ethics, the International Journal of Ecoforestry, Organization Environment, and also the Association for the Study of Literature and the Environment. Today, Professor <coughs> Merchant excuse me, uh, will be speaking on partnership with nature, women, and the environment. Please um, help me welcome Professor Merchant. Well, it's wonderful uh, to come to Indiana University. And when I was starting my graduate work in history of science, Indiana was starting a department of history of science, and I have not uh, visited it until today. So I'm glad to be here at uh, Indiana University and to talk about uh, partnership with nature. And because this is Women's History Month, I'm delighted to um, be here on behalf also of uh, women and gender uh, gender studies, the Department of Gender Studies, and uh, the Center for Advanced Studies in the Humanities, and other um, groups on campus. And uh, I'm talking today about partnership with nature with the idea of proposing a new ethic by which humans can relate to the environment. Now, in the um, 
1960s, environmentalism uh, became a major movement, although it had roots certainly going back um, in this country to the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And at the time that environmentalism uh, took uh, flower again in the 1960s, people began to talk about an environmental approach to nature <clears throat> called an ecocentric ethic, an ethic that is centered on the ecosystem itself. Other environmental ethics um, that uh, came to the foreground at that time are egocentric ethics grounded in the individual and the individual's ability to um, raise themselves up by uh, p participating in the kind of uh, capitalist democratic so society that we have now, but what are the implications of that for the environment? A second environmental ethic was called anthropocentric ethics or homocentric ethics, and that ethic comes out of utilitarianism and the idea that is what is good for the greatest number for the longest time will benefit society as a whole. And when you apply that idea to conservation and to the environment, um, you get a human-centered or a society-centered ethic. Now, the reason I want to talk about partnership ethics is because I think there are limitations to all those three ways that have been traditionally used in the environmental movement uh, to talk about the human relationship to non-human nature. And I see partnership as emerging from feminism and ecofeminism. Um, I consider myself an ecofeminist. I first heard the term in the early 1980s, and I just finished writing my book, The Death of Nature. And uh, people said to me, all right, so nature is dead. Now what do we do? And when I heard the term ecofeminism, I realized that this is a way of bringing together the goals of uh, the women's movement and the goals and objectives of the environmental movement. Well, ecofeminism has developed over time just like environmental ethics have. And what I want to try to do is to deal with some of the criticisms both of ecofeminism and of ecocentrism and try to formulate an ethic that is based on partnership where men and women are both equals and where humanity and the environment are equal and interactive. So in talking about the uh, partnership ethic, I want to first talk about what it is and why we need it at this particular time in uh, the early 21st century. Uh, what are some of its historical roots? Where did it come from? Uh, who began talking about uh, a partnership with nature or cooperation with nature? And then I want to give some examples of how a partnership ethic can actually help us to solve some of the environmental problems that we face today. So I formulate the partnership ethic as follows. The greatest good for the human and non-human communities is in their mutual living interdependence. Now this um, combines what I think of as the best of utilitarianism or the greatest good of the greatest number for the longest time which also has begun to incorporate environmental justice uh, into it, and ecocentrism, uh, or the good of the ecological whole of which humans are one part. And I see humans and the non-human environment in a dynamic relationship which is uh, based on process and dialectics and interaction. 
So we, um, as a human community, for example, here in Bloomington, um, are a human community living within a non-human uh, natural environment. And there are interactions between us as humans and the natural environment around us. We take things from nature that we need for our um, continuation, for our own reproduction over time, food, clothing, shelter, and energy. And we give back to nature also. And we give back to nature th through recycling and through reuse and through uh, careful farming, uh, use of fertilizers to fertilize the soil, and so on. So nature is a dynamic actor in this relationship. Nature is alive. Nature uh, has been personified in the past as an individual, as a mother, a virgin, sometimes a witch, sometimes a vixen. And whether or not nature is personified, nevertheless, non-human nature is a dynamic, interacting, ecological uh, system. So what is different about my proposal for an environmental ethic is that it is not grounded in the ego or the individual person or in society or in the ecosystem, but in relation, in relationship. The grounding for the ethic is in process and in give and take. So the greatest good for the human and non-human communities lies in this interaction. And this is very um, reminiscent in, in some ways of Native Americans' uh, relationships with the land and indigenous peoples' relationships uh, with their environments. It has um, several precepts that help to explain uh, what the ethic is. And the first of those is equity between the human and non-human communities. So we are a human community, and we are living within a non-human community. And that in, in the environmental ethic that I want to propose, there is equal status, equal give and take. Not humans being dominant over nature, as has been often the case in the last 300 years or so since the scientific revolution, and not nature dominant over human beings, which was the case for most of human history, uh, going back to uh, very earliest times, where people simply had to play the hand that nature dealt. We now have power and the ability through science and technology to both understand and control and manage nature. But on the other hand, we need to allow non-human nature the breathing room to continue to exist and continue to reproduce and provide uh, for humans the things that uh, we need from it. The second precept is the idea of moral consideration for both humans and other species. So humans' ethics have, have almost always applied to humans, and the idea that human beings have moral considerability. And this, of course, goes back to the Old uh, Testament and to the earliest environmental or the earliest human uh, ethical systems. But environmentalists and animal rights activists have in the last um, several decades tried to bring non-human uh, species into this idea of moral considerability, or even going beyond that, the land itself, as in Aldo Leopold's uh, land ethic. So that is a very important dimension of the ecocentric ethic that I think we need to bring into this idea of partnership ethics. The third idea is a respect for both cultural diversity and biodiversity. As human beings and as human communities all over the globe, 
uh, we have evolved different systems of culture and within those cultures different ways of interacting uh, with the land and natural resources. So cultural diversity all over the globe is a precious thing and as uh, indigenous tribes are discovered or brought into the global capitalist system, a lot of that cultural diversity seems to be um, fading as people become westernized uh, and capitalized. So biodiversity likewise is a very important precept for um, ecologists, uh, for biologists who realize the loss, the continual loss of uh, species that aren't even named yet, um, who, which are disappearing uh, as the Amazon forests are cut down or the forests of Indonesia and so on, where uh, people s simply don't even know yet the taxonomy of the existing species. A fourth idea which comes out of the women's movement and the environmental justice movement is the inclusion of women and minorities as well as non-human nature into our code of ethical accountability. So I, I bring this up uh, to highlight that most ethics have come in the past out of a patriarchal society and have applied to uh, men. And feminist ethics, ecofeminist ethics, have attempted to apply those ideas to women and their place, and do women have a particular kind of ethical relationship that may differ from, say, utilitarianism. Similarly, the environmental justice movement has argued that minorities need to be recognized, and they also have talked about the idea of, uh, of becoming full and equal partners with um, the dominant society. And the fifth idea is that a pr very practical idea, and that is one of management. An ecologically sound management is one that's consistent with the continued health of the human community and the health of the non-human community. And so if we're going to survive uh, into the 21st, 22nd, 23rd centuries, we need to be healthy as humans and healthy as nature. So <clears throat> why do we need a partnership ethics? Um, we're, as many people know, we're in a global ecological crisis, as Al Gore calls it, an inconvenient truth. Uh, we need to recognize that that um, is a characteristic of the time that we're living in right now. And that <coughs> uh, ecological crisis is characterized by a number of problems, um, climate change or global warming, uh, the depletion of uh, ozone, uh, deforestation, uh, soil erosion around the world. Uh, the loss of species, the loss of forests, and especially the growth of population. And this uh, cartoon here, which you see on the screen, uh, shows the world totally populated by people. Each one of those dots is a person, and people are overflowing the continents and the land area of the Earth. And so some wise guy down here says, OK, now what? So be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth, uh, which uh, comes out of Genesis 2, um, has raised a question, well, what do we do uh, next? Population growth is leveling off, and it is uh, beginning to have an effect um, perhaps uh, by 2040, the projections are maybe now maybe 9 uh, billion people, but we're getting pretty close uh, to those numbers already.
So uh, where did uh, uh, the idea of replenishing and subduing the earth uh, come from? Of course, the Bible, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, provided mandates uh, throughout human history, particularly mandates in the uh, Renaissance and Scientific Revolution to reinvent the whole earth uh, as a lost Garden of Eden. And uh, uh, Cranick, Lucas Cranick's uh, picture here of Adam and Eve uh, show uh, the story of the fall from Eden. The rise of science and technology gives people the power to recreate that lost Eden, to reinvent the whole planet as an Eden on Earth. And we can recover uh, from the fall uh, by recreating uh, the whole Earth as by cutting down forests and creating gardens, by irrigating deserts and creating gardens, and managing nature. Now this picture is quite interesting because here it shows, in my view, Eve as the first scientist. Eve is the one who is so bold as to take the apple and taste the apple. Eve is the one who talks to nature. She talks to the snake. Eve is the one who ingests nature into her body and becomes um, like nature. She knows nature both through her mind and through her body. And um, Adam here is very uncertain whether he wants to participate in the experiment. Uh, Mark Twain uh, wrote an interesting um, uh, a little book called Extracts from Adam's Diary. And he says, she is taken up with a snake now. The other animals are glad, for she was always experimenting with them. And I am glad, because the snake talks, and this enables me to get a rest. <laughs> I advised her to keep away from that tree. She said she wouldn't. I foresee trouble will emigrate. <laughs> so um, here is the idea uh, of Eve um, as the scientist who helps us to understand the world and helps us to recover the lost um, Eden. Now there are certain problems uh, with doing that. Uh, but nevertheless, science and technology are a very important part of uh, allowing humans to um, have sufficient food, clothing, shelter, energy, and quality of life. So science is, and technology are very important parts of what we want to retain and maintain as um, our population uh, continues to grow. However, we can go too far with it. And one of the issues that comes up in the scientific revolution of the 17th century is expressed very aptly uh, by Francis Bacon in his Novum Organum, or the New Organon, which is, means it's a replacement for Aristotle's Organon, and it actually means the new instrument. It's the idea of instrumental knowledge the mind as an instrument operating on nature as an instrument to create a form of knowledge that gives humanity the power to dominate and control nature. And Bacon phrased it, man can recover that right over nature which belongs to it by divine bequest. And he says, man should establish and extend the power and dominion of the human race over the entire universe. Now Bacon's goal here was uh, perfectly adequate in that he wanted to make knowledge public for the benefit of humankind. And this was the uh, methodology 
uh, which he proposed. Uh, and he said, man by the fall fell at the same time from his state of innocency and from his dominion over creation. But both of these losses can in this life be in some part repaired, he said, the former by religion and faith and the latter by arts and science. So by arts and science, uh, humanity could recover that lost uh, garden. This is an objective which is brought forward and brought to fruition by the end of the 17th century with Newton's Principia Mathematica, uh, published in 1687, which brings together the discoveries in astronomy of Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo and the discoveries in terrestrial mechanics uh, by uh, Galileo and the discovery of momentum and energy, um, conservation of momentum and energy into a synthesis in which the world now is no longer a living organism or a mother or even a witch, now no longer an organic, organic entity, but a, a clockwork universe, a machine, a machine whose parts are inert and which can be moved uh, from place to place as if it was a billiard ball universe. So God in this universe becomes a clockmaker, an engineer, the supreme mathematician who orders the cosmos and sets the uh, particles uh, of matter in motion and then the motion is transferred from one to another. But these particles are not alive, they don't have spirits within them, they are inert uh, particles of matter. So in that sense, nature is dead. The matter is inert and simply manipulated through the laws of nature. The, besides experimentation, the other major th contribution of the scientific revolution is the mathematization of nature. Mathematical equations, if they can be set up to describe falling bodies or gravitation, allow one to predict. If you can write an equation and solve the equation, you can predict what is going to happen. And if you can predict, you can dominate and control. And so that, uh, through experimentation that Bacon um, developed and was um, so influential in, and mathematics that come uh, out of uh, Descartes and Newton and others, uh, we can, as humans, as humanity, gain this power and control over nature. And so that gives us the capability, which was so important to the 18th century enlightenment, of human reason and human ability uh, to manage uh, the environment. What happens then with this um, new sense of tremendous excitement and tremendous power is with the um, movement of Europeans into the uh, Americas and across the temperate regions of the world, the idea that through science and technology, the wilderness can be transformed into gardens. And this becomes the mainstream story of Western culture. The recovery of Eden is the mainstream story of Western culture from the scientific revolution uh, to the present. And we do that through the technologies that allow us to deplete the forests, um, irrigate the deserts, and make the deserts uh, blossom as the rose. And as we come forward with that narrative, that mainstream narrative today, it applies to biotechnology. Uh, in the beginning was the genome, and uh, here, here we can see both Adam and Eve uh, taking the apple. Um, this picture in the New Scientist uh, in, in 1990 shows 
the snake now as the DNA spiral. So genetic engineering epitomizes the mechanization of nature that began in the 17th century and progressed through uh, the discoveries in electricity and magnetism and thermodynamics and then ultimately um, now into uh, biotechnology. So these kinds of issues which have given humanity so much power need to be restrained through some form of ethic if nature as an actor is going uh, to survive. And that's why I think we need this uh, partnership ethics in which nature becomes a partner in the ethical relationships. We get this beginnings of this new ethic in the conservation movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries in which uh, the forest reserves are created, uh, species like the bison um, are saved, and uh, songbirds, which have been used for women's hats, um, come to the forefront and people begin to form movements, the Audubon movement, uh, the forest movement, they found clubs like the Sierra uh, Club and the um, Audubon Society. Rangelands are reseeded, soils are conserved, and so we have the first beginnings of a new relationship, a new narrative coming uh, with the conservation movement of the late uh, 19th century. And the person who begins to see that in terms of partnership is George Perkins Marsh, wrote an incredible book called Man and Nature in 1864. It's something like 500 pages long, and it became a bestseller over the next decade, which is incredible because it means that it spoke to a need that people were beginning uh, to feel um, as they could see around them uh, the diminishing of, uh, of forests and animals and uh, the transformation into cities uh, which were polluted and um, uh, Marsh, who had been an ambassador to Turkey and to the Mediterranean, saw that what was going on in Italy and the forests of Italy and what had happened to Greece in the past was now perhaps going to happen um, in the Americas. And so he said, man should become a co-worker with nature in the reconstruction of the damaged fabric. This is the beginning of the idea of restoration, of restoration ecology. How can we be repair and restore the damages that have already uh, been done? He says, we can restore the waters, forests, and bogs that are laid waste by human improvidence or malice. So Marsh is one of the people who begin to talk in terms of what I would now see as partnership. Another is Aldo Leopold, whose land ethic becomes the basis for the ecocentric ethic. Um, and uh, he, he publishes the land ethic in his Sand County Almanac. But in 1939, he also wrote an uh, essay called The Farmer as Conservationist. And he said, when land does well for its owner and the owner does well by his land, when both end up better by reason of their partnership, then we have conservation. So human activities on the land can help to restore the land and take care of the land. Women uh, perhaps most forcefully put forward the idea of partnership. Among them, uh, Rianne Eisler, in The Chalice and the Blade, and uh, later in her book, Sacred Pleasures. And her idea is that human society took a 5,000-year detour from an original partnership society uh, in the deep past to dominator societies, 
where one sex, particularly the uh, male in patriarchal societies, was dominant over the other sex. And she argues that even in matriarchal societies, if they indeed existed, uh, they would be dominator societies because women would be dominant um, over uh, men. And so she argues that what we need is a return to the idea of a partnership society and a politics of partnership. And she symbolizes the dominator society by the blade and the partnership society uh, by the chalice. And she calls this partnership gyleny, um, linking uh, gyne from women and andros uh, from man, linked by um, the letter L. Another person who has talked about um, ideas that feed into partnership, especially the notion that it should be grounded in relation, is a uh, uh, Val Plumwood, a uh, recently uh, deceased uh, uh, Australian philosopher, uh, lived in um, near Canberra, Braidwood, on a piece of land that um, was populated by plumwood trees. And she took her name from the uh, plumwood trees and she built her own solar uh, home and she admitted nature into her home, as you can see here in the form of a wombat, uh, which uh, she uh, even invited into her bedroom. Uh, but she and the wombat had this partnership relationship, and uh, she argued that it's the, not the mastery and control of nature but the relationship with nature that is the basic basis of a new ethic, an ethic of care. And that ethic, of course, comes out of feminist and eco-feminist philosophy. And she says that the relational self, not the egocentric self, but the relational self is rooted in respect and friendship and care for the other being, whether it is a man or another animal or a tree or the land itself. So this is the basis then for non-dominating interactions that would allow us as an earth community uh, to flourish. Another person who I think is a founder of the idea of partnership is Allison Jagger, a philosopher at the University of Colorado at Boulder, who has written on feminist ethics and multi multicultural democracies, extending the idea of discourse, the relationship that we establish with others, other cultures, as well as other beings on the planet. Um, is grounded in an idea of listening and of responsibility and responsiveness through our emotions to other entities. So we learn to listen uh, to the voice of nature and to engage in a discourse with non-human nature in uh, the form of partnership. One of the uh, most important spokespersons for the idea of the voice of nature is David Abram. David Abram is a magician. And he, uh, if you see him uh, giving a lecture, uh, you will see him manipulating uh, marbles and knives and things like that while he's talking about uh, attracting condors and other birds uh, uh, to him where he is able to listen to their voice and, and uh, hear them speak. And he argues that human society um, was originally responsive to the full range of sensuous engagement with nature but we have lost that through the alphabet and through alphanumeric uh, literacy. 
And here he is as a writer saying, well, how can we regain that um, through words, which he says are the problem themselves, but he wants us to listen to nature's voice and write in such a way that we uh, can communicate it. The rustling of leaves in an oak tree or an aspen grove is itself, he says, a kind of voice. We should listen to the rhythm and lilt of the local uh, soundscape. We should engage with nature with all our senses, not just reason, which uh, was so important to the Enlightenment, but our whole bodies and uh, all our senses. A critique of the mechanistic wor uh, view of nature and the idea of domination and control as the human ability uh, to predict and therefore to dominate comes from chaos theorists and complexity theorists. Edward Lorentz um, wrote a famous article called The, um, the Butterfly Effect. Um, can a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil result in a tornado in Texas? Uh, Lorentz was an atmospheric uh, scientist and he was trying to figure out how accurately could we predict the weather. He, uh, through his um, mathematical uh, equations, discovered the idea of sensitive dependence on initial conditions, that weather patterns are fundamentally irregular and chaotic, hence unpredictable, and that irregularity is in fact a property of the environment, of nature itself. So many environmental systems and biological systems are uh, chaotic and described at best by nonlinear equations, which are often uh, unable to be solved or at best only approximated. If you recognize that nature is fundamentally has uh, chaotic or unpredictable properties to it, then we realize that the vast aspect of nature may be unpredictable and it's only the smaller confined domain which we can predict and control through linear differential equations. So here is an idea that we need to recognize the unpredictability of the natural world and even if we can only approximate it, that gives us the sense that we have to back off from the human hubris that we can uh, control and dominate nature. So how do we do this? Um, how can we, as a human community, interact and engage with a nature that we no longer think of as a clockwork mechanism. Well, one idea is through the formation of environmental partnerships. And there are numerous examples of these partnerships. Um, the Management Institute for Environment and Business in Washington, D.C. has published a series of books on environmental partnerships. And these are voluntary collaborations among people and organizations that come together to try to solve a particular problem or create a specific goal. The idea is not to go through litigation and the courts, but rather to come together before you get to that uh, point and try to create cooperative agreements among stakeholders. So now the negotiating table includes people in the business community, scientists, engineers, technologists, environmental planners, ecologists, minorities and women who will be at the table and can speak for themselves, but also includes people who speak 
for particular natural entities who speak for nature, who are able to listen to and hear the voice of nature and bring that to the discourse. Community members um, and planners and designers can work cooperatively with nature and with each other in multicultural teams that include both uh, men and women. Ecological science and ecologists are part of the open, interacting relational systems rather than the closed systems of mechanistic science. Some examples of how this has been done come from a, an exhibit called Nature Constructed, Nature uh, Revealed. And um, so these uh, show examples of how men and women uh, can work together with nature as a partner. The voice of the soil um, is um, one proposal which was not accepted, but it was a proposal for Governor's Island um, in New York City. It was called The Soil That New York Rejected and Recollects um, by Anu Matur and Dilip de Kuna. They're a husband-wife team of landscape architecture and um, planners. And what they did was to propose a design for Governor's Island um, outside, uh, just in New York, uh, outside of New York, in New York Harbor. And they argued that he, uh, the island itself was evolved for millions of years as hard bedrock on one end. The other end was soft soil that was taken out of New York City in the tunnels that were created as um, the subways were dug and the water uh, systems and electrical systems um, uh, cr were uh, created under New York and that soil was put onto Governor's Island on the other end. So here you have this one end which is firm and uh, hard and the other which is soft and shifting. And so they uh, proposed that um, on one end you would have the functions, for example, of theater and design and exhibit on the bedrock end, and the other end you would have walkways and ways of engaging uh, with nature. And so here the soil has a voice. The voice of the displaced soil is the flux that moves between the firmness and fixity um, at each end of the uh, governor's island. Another example comes from a woman, uh, Joan Nashauer, who worked in uh, Maplewood, Minnesota, with a community of residents there, uh, which um, uh, was located in a place that was prone to flooding and major engineering problems. And so she worked with the community itself to reintroduce wetlands and prairie into this location in order to help resolve the uh, problems of flooding. The people in the community didn't particularly want uh, to uh, have to go through the disruption that it caused, but by working together they recognized that the vacant lots and backyards could be reintroduced as native prairie and that a touch of wildness could be brought uh, to these traditional lower middle class neighborhoods. Now, what can you do to work with nature as a partner in the case of chaotic unpredictability? Hurricanes, earthquakes, fire. Um, how can we possibly be partners with forces that are so devastating uh, to human communities as uh, these? Well, a number of people have proposed examples, but one of them comes from Yellowstone National Park, where fire had been suppressed for um, many decades, and the suppression of fire had created particular types of ecologies over a hundred years. 
And then Yellowstone uh, went up in flames and a whole new um, set of relationships emerged. So the idea that comes with uh, fire uh, prevention now is cool ground fires that are set frequently. Sometimes those get out of hand. But other times, uh, most when it's done uh, correctly, uh, fire, uh, intensive fires, uh, can be managed um, through this uh, uh, technique. Another example from uh, Oakland, uh, just outside Berkeley, Louise Mazingo is a landscape architecture at the University of California at Berkeley. And she worked with a culturally diverse community of African Americans, Asian Americans, European Americans, Hispanics, who lived together in an area of the Oakland Hills where there was, again, danger of fire, uh, chaparral landscape with oak openings, which is what Oakland uh, takes its name from. And over time, over a period of a couple of years, these these groups met um, every couple of weeks or every month to work out a plan for how to manage the landscapes within which they lived. And uh, they produced a plan for the Glenn W. Daniel King Estate Park um, in Oakland, which took into consideration the oak openings, which were originally there, the chaparral plants, and added to that um, security and pathways and um, community centers uh, for people to engage uh, with nature. Another example of women working uh, with nature in partnership uh, comes from mining in southwestern Pennsylvania, in Vittendale, Pennsylvania, where immigrants from Europe had been employed for um, a century ago to mine the land around it. And it was now abandoned. There were uh, acid uh, chemicals and pollution, bright orange uh, chemicals that uh, appeared in the landscape. It was uh, a toxic environment. And Julie Bargman and Stacy Levy produced a plan where you could work with nature using chemistry to create settling ponds in which the pH of the water uh, would be gradually changed so it moved from its acidic state um, to a more uh, neutral pH. And each, the colors of the ponds went from orange to uh, blue, green, and uh, then to blue. And around it were planted uh, trees and vegetation that echoed that whole process of uh, conversion and restoring the health uh, to the environment and to the water. And then um, one more example from Los Angeles, near the freeways, uh, the 110 freeway, um, is another example of ecological and human health, where Acheva uh, Stein, Stein and Norman, Norman Millar um, produced a plan for using the land under the freeways to uh, grow uh, things, uh, crops, uh, with um, using gray water or non-toxic materials, um, to have playgrounds around the areas, to have parking structures with um, gardens uh, and solar uh, sources on top of them. And so to integrate within the environment a partnership between humanity and nature in the form of restoration. So what I'd like to conclude from these um, uh, ideas that where we go from the idea of uh, the fall from Eden and the mainstream narrative of Western culture being uh, to reinvent Eden on Earth to 
a new narrative, a narrative of partnership and process between humanity and nature, where humanity can listen to nature's voice and respond to nature with care and reverence, where we can work in cooperation, as George Perkins Marsh said, cooperate uh, with nature as a non-human partner, or as David Abram puts it, a more than human partner, and to end up with a partnership ethic that offers the possibility for a healthier and more aesthetically pleasing environment that is sustainable uh, for the future for uh, our own and future generations. Thank you very much. Uh, um, when we set aside wilderness areas, or particularly wilderness areas that are not accessible, maybe by helicopter, but not accessible by trails or roads, um, there are going to be places like that all over the planet where we decide that those are going to be allowed to exist and whatever goes on in them um, will happen. Uh, ecological relationships without our intervention. So the whole idea of wilderness and wilderness settings is one way uh, to accomplish what you're suggesting, that non-human beings can interact with each other. Now some people have argued that that's a prison, that we're putting a boundary around it and imprisoning the wilderness in this boundary. But on the other hand, we can think of a, a sort of a continuum of possible types of land. Some land that will have uh, be completely unavailable uh, for humans. Others where we manage it somewhat more intensively, like the national parks. Others where we have in situ conservation by indigenous peoples around the world who have lived in those lands and stewarded them uh, for many uh, centuries. And then lands which are much more intensively managed and urban areas where we have parks and uh, we have areas of restored marshes. And you may have a business community on one part of it and the rest of it is set aside uh, for walkways and for bird watching or for even for fishing maybe. So there's a whole continuum of possibilities, all of which I think of as examples of partnership. We have a lot of difficulties between men and women becoming partners, but I think we're making great progress on that front. I, I talk to my students and they tell me that they're families that they've grown up in are much more like partnerships than the families that maybe I and my mother and grandmother uh, grew up in. Uh, the world, um, yes, nations as uh, competitors in a global capitalist economy, warfare, uh, that's a really tough problem. Both capitalism and uh, the kind of warfare that we're uh, seeing going on today is an example of chaos, I agree with you, and uh, very difficult. But the idea of care and respect and listening are, I think, the way to start to try and solve uh, some of those problems. Coming to the negotiating table, not with hardened positions that you're gonna fight for, but coming to the negotiating table with the idea that everyone is stakeholders and we want to achieve a certain goal, the question is how do we get to it? And it may mean in the case of environmental issues, uh, taking a weekend to engage in the council of all beings where people take on the identity of different beings and uh, listen and speak to each other. In the case of uh, nations at war, it's a different type of kind of discourse and uh, negotiation. But I think negotiation has to be at the key. Well, I mean, Darwin is extremely complex. And what we hear often about Darwin is uh, 
competition and survival of the species. But Darwin was very sensitive to ecological relationships as well. In fact, ecology, as per, uh, first named by Ernst Haeckel, came out of his reading out of Darwin. So I think uh, understanding the complexity of Darwin's ideas can be very helpful um, rather than sort of just pegging Darwinianism as an example of capitalism uh, or um, of social Darwinism. Um, I think there's much more breadth and depth to Darwin than some of those offshoots uh, recognize. I haven't really looked at Darwin from that point of view, but the fact that uh, he his ideas were important to Heckel, and Heckel's ideas were brought to the United States by Ellen Swallow Richards in um, 1892. She proposed the word ecology in the United States, and she uh, had read Heckel, and the women's uh, movements, the women's sanitation movement, and the women who were working for clean air and clean water, used that idea of the human home, of human ecology. Uh, so that may be a, 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 a kind of trail of Darwinianism into a, a kind of a different um, form of conservation and of human ecology. Well, I think it results in living in harmony but I think of partnership being a, a more active idea than sort of living in harmony would convey. A partner is an active uh, engagement on each side. Nature is active. Nature is an active partner, and humans are active, and they are engaged in a give and take and a relationship which will end up in a particular direction. Um, Hopefully, that will end up in harmony, but I think it's a little bit too passive to just call it harmony with nature. Well, I, I do think we have to actively understand how it works, and one of the results of doing that is to realize that nature as we know it today is not going to continue to exist unless we understand ecological systems as open, systems in which uh, matter and energy flow across boundaries and which uh, nature has something to give to us and we have something to give uh, to nature. So negotiation um, is one term, discourse, um, listening, caring, hearing, tasting, all of those things are part of it, not just uh, negotiation. Right, well we've had lots of examples of conquest and imperialism and mastery and subversion. Um, how do we achieve cooperation uh, when nations uh, uh, and their future and survival are at stake? Um, diplomacy, the United Nations, um, new ways of uh, trying to maybe hold back and not to impose all our ideas and systems on other uh, peoples. So just as we're holding back from mastering nature, we can hold back from the capabilities we have to subdue other uh, countries. I mean, you're asking an enormous question um, and maybe uh, going to diplomatic school or whatever would be a way to uh, approach that. Right, well, there's uh, clearly many voices and there are going to be situations in which some of those voices are so dominant that it's not going to give way to the possibility of a new way of listening. Um, so this idea of partnership negotiating table <laughs> is not going to work in maybe uh, quite a number of instances. There are going to be uh, situations
which are so hardcore or where the voices are so dominant and strong that other voices can't be heard. So I don't think this is a panacea for everything. Um, in those cases, maybe you have to ultimately go through litigation. But I think you're absolutely right that um, there, are very, there are many voices. And where it's possible for people to express those voices and to listen to those voices, then we have the possibility of a partnership negotiation.